Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. Good morning, I'm Nathan Hager. And I'm Karen Moscow. Here are the stories we're following today. Karen, we begin with President-elect Donald Trump making key position announcements as he starts to form his second administration. In a social media post, Trump said he will install Tom Homan as a border czar with oversight over immigration, maritime, and aviation security. We get more from Bloomberg News Senior Editor Bill Ferries. Tom Homan used to run the... Customs Enforcement Agency. He was really the guy partly responsible for this uh, family separation policy that defined Trump's position policy at the uh, at the U.S.-Mexico border. He will be some kind of a border czar, which means he won't have to face Senate confirmation and can try to run things right out of the White House next to the president. Bloomberg's Bill Ferry says the president-elect is expected to use czar-like positions to concentrate power among loyalists in the White House, giving appointees broad discretion over government departments and agencies to implement his agenda. Well, Nathan, Donald Trump is also turning to a key member of leadership in Congress to be his next U.N. ambassador. The president-elect told the New York Post in a statement that he's naming New York Congresswoman Elise Stefanik to the position. Stefanik is currently the fourth-ranking Republican in the House and is one of Trump's highest-profile allies on Capitol Hill. She was one of the 147 House Republicans who voted against certifying President Biden's win in 2020, and she was the first House member to endorse Trump's 2024 run. And Karen, Republicans are edging closer to winning control of the House and pulling off a clean sweep with 218 seats needed to keep their majority. The Associated Press has called 213 races for the GOP, and the latest is Arizona's first district. Republican incumbent David Schweikert held on against Democrat Amish Shaw with 52 percent of the vote to 48 percent. Nineteen House races are still in play. Many of them are in California, which takes longer than most states to count its absentee ballots. Well, Nathan, President Biden will host President-elect Donald Trump at the White House this week for the first post-election meeting. They'll meet at the Oval Office at 11 a.m. Eastern on Wednesday. That will be setting in motion the transition of power that will be completed in January. And at that meeting, Karen Biden is expected to argue in favor of continued U.S. aid to Ukraine. White House National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan spoke on CBS's Face the Nation. Of course, President Biden will have the opportunity over the next 70 days to make the case to the Congress and to the incoming administration that the United States should not walk away from Ukraine, that walking away from Ukraine means more instability in Europe. And ultimately, as the Japanese prime minister said, if we walk away from Ukraine in Europe, the question about America's commitment to our allies in Asia will grow. The White House National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan's comments come as Trump's election victory and Republican control of potentially both houses of Congress raise questions about the future of U.S. support for Ukraine. Meanwhile, Nathan Trump reportedly spoke with Russian President Vladimir Putin last Thursday, two days after the election. The Washington Post is reporting Trump advised Putin not to escalate the war in Ukraine. This morning, the Kremlin is denying the two leaders spoke. During his campaign, Trump said he would bring an immediate end to the conflict. Let's turn to markets now, Karen. U.S. bond markets are closed because it's Veterans Day, but stocks, they're coming off their best week of the year. It rose 4.7 percent during the election week, with the S&P 500 hitting its 50th record. Record this year. Mona Mahajan, senior investment strategist at Edward Jones, says the equity rallies broadening across various sectors and expects that to continue post election. We do think that that broadening of market leadership theme does have legs independent of what was happening in politics. We were seeing a lower Fed funds rate lower interest rates, as well as a broadening of earnings expansion driving that story. Mm -hmm. Uh, We think the addition of those pro-growth policies adds some fuel to that fire. Mona Mahajan of Edward Jones says the equity rally could broaden further if some of uh, President-elect Trump's pro-growth policies are passed. And, Nathan, we are seeing some of the Trump trades still in effect this morning. Bitcoin hitting another all-time high. Bloomberg Markets reporter Valerie Titel says the move is very clearly linked to Trump's election win. Since the 1st of November, Bitcoin has rallied 15 percent overnight across the 81,000 level mark, up another percent so far in this morning's trade. Trump seen as very friendly to cryptocurrency assets and then pair that with the fact that he's teamed up with Elon Musk that seems very positive for cryptocurrencies generally. And we've seen Bitcoin not win. Wait for any further clarity, but take a leap higher on that. And Bloomberg's Valerie Titel says Bitcoin has soared by more than 90 percent in value this year. And earnings season's winding down, Karen. But we do get reports from nearly a dozen companies in the S&P 500 this week, including Home Depot. Let's get a preview now from Bloomberg's Charlie Pellet. 
Bloomberg Intelligence says the home improvement retailer's same-store sales are expected to slide for an eighth consecutive quarter as lower existing home sales continue to challenge sales. BI says the impact of hurricanes may add a revenue boost and increase costs in subsequent quarters. So far this year, the stock is up 17.1 percent. 29 analysts say it's a buy, 11 say it's a hold, and four say it's a sell. In New York, Charlie Pellet, Bloomberg Radio. All right, Charlie, thank you. Turning to the economy, Minneapolis Fed President Neil Kashkari says the economy remains remarkably strong, but inflation still remains. We need to finish the job. We want to have confidence that inflation is going to go all the way back down to our 2 percent target. And Minneapolis Fed President Neil Kashkari made the comments on CBS's Face the Nation. Catch the program Sunday afternoon on Bloomberg Radio. And it is time now for a look at some of the other stories making news in New York and around the world. And for that, we're joined by Bloomberg's John Tucker. John, good morning. And good morning, Karen. Just a week after Donald Trump's resounding election victory, a Manhattan judge is poised to decide whether to uphold the hush money verdict against him or dismiss it. Now, that's because of the U.S. Supreme Court decision back in July that gave presidents broad immunity from criminal prosecution. Judge Juan Marchand has said he'll issue a written opinion on Tuesday. Nearly 200 nations meeting at the annual United Nations Summit this week must now consider how to avoid catastrophic climate change without help from the world's biggest economy. Donald Trump has vowed to take the U.S. out of the landmark 2015 Paris Agreement once again. His presence will loom over negotiators, even though he won't be at the COP29 climate conference in person. FTX filed a lawsuit against Anthony Scaramucci and his hedge fund, Skybridge Capital. Let's get more from Bloomberg's Denise Pellegrini. The lawsuit against the former White House communications director is part of a broader effort to claw back money for creditors of the bankrupt company. FTX alleges during the crypto winter of 2022, founder and now jailed Sam Bankman fried engaged in a campaign of influence buying. And the bankrupt crypto firm alleges Bankman fried invested $67 million into various Skybridge endeavors. FTX is now seeking to recover more than $100 million in damages. Denise Pellegrini Blue Bloomberg Radio. Global news 24 hours a day and whenever you want it with Bloomberg News Now. I'm John Tucker and this is Bloomberg Karen. All right, John Tucker, thank you. Time now for the Bloomberg Sports Update, brought to you by Tri-State Audi. Here's John Stashauer. John, good morning. Good morning, Karen. The NFL Sunday began in Munich, where the fans were drinking and singing songs. Didn't seem to mind they were watching a pair of 2-7 and seven teams. They saw Carolina take a 10-point lead. The Giants rallied in the fourth quarter to force overtime and then won the coin flip to get the ball first. Tyrone Tracy fumbled on the first play, and the Panthers won 20-17. Tracy, to his credit, owned up after the game. I put a lot into this game, you know, um, blood, sweat, and tears, you know, the same old everybody say, but, like, uh, I play with passion. I feel like you can see it on the field. Um, I have a lot of energy, um, and I hold myself to a high standard. Um, so, you know, when things like that happen with the game on the line, you know, in overtime, we come all the way back, like, you know, that's the last thing on your mind that you want to happen. Giants go to the bye week with a five-game losing streak. Later, it was the Jets getting walloped by the Cardinals, 31-6. to Arizona scored touchdowns on their first three possessions. Kyler Murray. 22 of 24 as the Jets drop to 3 and 7. Looked like Kansas City would suffer its first loss. Denver lined up for a game winning field goal. Lux waiting for the snap. Placement is down. Lux's kick is blocked. It's blocked. It's blocked. The Chiefs blocked the kick. They're going to stay undefeated. On 106 5, the Wolf. Chiefs won 16 14. They're 9 0. Detroit 8 1. Didn't look good last night for them. In Houston, down 23 7 at halftime. The Lions roared back. To win 26-23, Jake Bates, who kicked a game-tying 58-yard field goal, kicked a 52-yarder to win it. Pittsburgh stays atop the AFC North, 28-27 at Washington. The Commanders fall out of first. Philadelphia takes the lead with a 34-6 route in Dallas. Jalen Hurts, two TDs passing, two running. Patriots won with a dominant defense, 19-3 in Chicago, held the Bears to 142 yards. Knicks lost at Indiana, 132-121. Pacers made 21 three-pointers. Knicks had only seven. Miami Marlins named Dodgers. Coach Clayton McCullough, their new manager. John Stash, our Bloomberg Sports, Karen and Ethan. 
Coast to Coast on Bloomberg Radio, nationwide on Sirius XM, and around the world on Bloomberg.com and the Bloomberg Business app. This is Bloomberg Daybreak. Good morning. I'm Nathan Hager. President-elect Donald Trump is making quick moves to fill out key positions for his second term. They include a new border czar, former acting ICE director Tom Homan, who may have hinted at his approach at the Republican National Convention back in July. As a guy who spent 34 years deporting illegal aliens, I got a message to the millions of illegal aliens that Joe Biden's releasing our country in violation of federal law. You better start packing now. Joining us for more on the president-elect's policy moves and more from the nation's capital, we are joined by Bloomberg News senior editor Bill Ferries. Bill, good morning. For those for whom Tom Homan is not necessarily a familiar name, what does his appointment suggest about how president-elect Trump could approach the immigration issue in his second term? Well, I think it tells you first uh, how important this issue is to President-elect Trump. I mean, he is really, uh, outside of his uh, chief of staff, Susie Wiles, uh, he is, uh, Tom Homan is one of the first names that the president-elect has announced. So it's uh, it's clear he's moving quickly on that. It's clear it's going to be a priority. And Tom Homan may not be a household name, uh, but his policies are certainly well known. He was really the author of the, the family separation policy that was so controversial during uh, President Trump's first term. Uh, and he has been a staunch defender of that approach uh, even back uh, since the, since it started in 2018. So I, I think it tells you how important it is. I think it tells you how quickly uh, President Trump wants to move. And the fact that he's going to be kind of a czar based in the White House means there's no uh, there won't be any need for a Senate confirmation process. So he can start essentially on day one with the president. Is there a suggestion then that the border czar could be a more powerful position under a second Trump administration than the Senate confirmable positions related to uh, immigration and border security? Well, certainly. I mean, we'll have to see how uh, other positions come out. Uh, but there is a there is a sense that perhaps uh, having learned from his first term, uh, President-elect Trump is going to uh, have a number of people who have, uh, you know, czar-like titles uh, based in the White House, essentially senior advisors or senior counselors who may, in fact, have more influence than uh, agency heads or even cabinet secretaries in some cases. Interesting as well that we're hearing one of the first Senate confirmable positions that President-elect Trump has announced is for United Nations ambassador. And he's turning to a pretty staunch loyalist on Capitol Hill to fill out that post. Yeah, he's turning to uh, Congresswoman Elise Stefanik, uh, someone who was really kind of more of a, a moderate Republican in her early years in Congress, but who uh, made a sharp turn, uh, became a big defender of President Trump in the second half of his term uh, was uh, someone who, you know, opposed his uh, votes of impeachment uh, and was actually, I think, the first uh, member of Congress to or one of the first to endorse him for a third term uh, ahead of this year's election. So uh, a true loyalist, uh, someone who will likely sit in the cabinet as a as a U.N. envoy and uh, and someone who, you know, um, the president, uh, president elect feels like he can trust wholeheartedly for the president elect to pick someone on Capitol Hill, a Republican uh, in the House. Does that suggest some kind of uh, confidence that uh, uh, President elect <laughs> Trump feels like the uh, uh, Republican Party is going to hold on to the House? It's still not quite called just yet in terms of the majority. It's not called. We have the latest at, uh, at, in terms of called races, 213 Republicans to 203 Democrats. Uh, there was one more uh, Republican seat uh, that was called in Arizona uh, about seven hours ago. Um, but it does look like uh, Republicans are leading in most of the uh, in the remaining seats by and large. Uh, so there is a lot of confidence on the Republican side that they will hold the Congress, the lower uh, the House of Representatives. Now, remember, holding it with a narrow lead can be uh, just as challenging as 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 uh, not having the majority. In some cases, we've seen Mike Johnson really struggle on in some situations to uh, get his caucus to vote. He's needed Democratic support in a lot of cases. Um, so uh, but you'd rather have a slim majority rather than a slim minority uh, heading into uh 
heading into the next, uh, you know, uh, cycle here. Got about a minute left, Bill. What to make of these now conflicting reports that uh, President-elect Trump had a phone call with Vladimir Putin of Russia just about two days after the election? Yeah, you know, the we're, there was a Washington Post story saying that uh, President Trump had a call with, with Putin, and then he warned uh, the Russian president against uh, escalating the war in Ukraine. Uh, you know, we don't have uh, any confirmation of that ourselves. Uh, it would not be a surprise. There are now uh, we've seen reports that uh, from Bob Woodward that uh, former President Trump may have had a number of calls with Vladimir Putin uh, during his four years away from the White House. Uh, he has promised to uh, end the war in Ukraine before taking office. So this would be in line with that. We know he did speak with the Ukraine President Zelensky. So uh, it, it is entirely plausible that they've had this talk and that they'll have more talks before President Trump is sworn in. This is Bloomberg Daybreak, your morning podcast on the stories making news from Wall Street to Washington and beyond. Look for us on your podcast feed by 6 a.m. Eastern each morning on Apple, Spotify, or anywhere else you listen. You can also listen live each morning starting at 5 a.m. Wall Street time on Bloomberg 1130 in New York, Bloomberg 991 in Washington, Bloomberg 929 in Boston, and nationwide on Sirius XM Channel 121. Plus, listen coast to coast on the Bloomberg Business app now with Apple CarPlay and Android Auto interfaces. And don't forget to subscribe to Bloomberg News Now. It's the latest news whenever you want it, in five minutes or less. Search Bloomberg News Now on your favorite podcast platform to stay informed all day long. I'm Karen Moscow. And I'm Nathan Hager. Join us again tomorrow morning for all the news you need to start your day right here on Bloomberg Daybreak.